This is the World Economic Forum's annual meeting 2022, Summer Davos, as we've been calling it for the last few days. And I have with me the Deputy Managing Director of Bharat Forge, Amrit Kalyani, to talk about the transformation that his business is going through and the India story as he sees it play out here in Davos. But Amit, before we get to both of those topics, um, a general sense of the mood amongst business here in Davos and what that tells you about the next 12 to 24 months? See, right now, being in the middle of Europe and Europe facing all these uncertainties, stresses, uh, huge inflation on account of energy, obviously the mood is circumspect. Um, there is a lot of confusion. There is a lot of concern. And there is very uh, low attendance. Yes. Wherein, you know, towards the end of May, uh, a lot of Europe is shutting down for holidays. A lot of European plants are taking holidays because of slack demand or uh, supply chain issues. So there is, a, I would say, a, definitely a lack of buzz at Davos, mm. as we spoke earlier. But um, I think you do see a lot of confidence and a lot of energy with the Indian companies here. I think the Indian companies have performed well during COVID. They have managed to overcome the challenges of COVID uh, in a reasonable manner. And I think they have most companies here from India have good reason to be confident about the future. Okay. And you feel that same way about the prospects? Ab absolutely. So that... Absolutely. Absolutely. So can you give us a sense of how you see the demand environment pan out? over the course of the next 6 to 12 months. I say this knowing that you already know, and I don't need to repeat it, all the challenges we're face facing. Absolutely. From input costs to the auto industry, chip issues, to now rising interest rates. Absolutely. So um, what we've done is we've completely started transforming our company. We have transformed it from one company into five verticals, right. each one being customer focused on its line of business or sector in order to make it nimble, faster, more agile, and more customer focused. So this allows us to have five times the amount of brain power doing the work than it was earlier. It was, it's not a monolithic company anymore, it's five verticals. Um, the five verticals are our industry, our automotive, conventional automotive vertical, right. industrial vertical, the defense vertical, the lightweighting and EV vertical, and the aerospace vertical. Some of them are small, some of them are large, but uh, we have now created a strategy of how we have to grow each one very substantially by 26. So we've set some very ambitious goals. I'm not going to talk about numbers or outlook, but let's just say that we are going to supercharge our growth. We see opportunities as last man standing in the conventional business by focusing on cost quality, engineering and technology and being a technology leader and a innovator in some of the newer areas. So we are investing in EV, in industrial. We believe industrial is going to be a big growth driver going forward because if you look at this whole clean energy uh, and decarbonization, it means creating alternative sources of energy, which is renewable, which is wind plus solar. There is a lot of hydrogen and hydrogen needs a lot of capital goods. So there is a lot of opportunity in that sector. Hydro and energy storage need a lot of uh, investment. So we see a lot of opportunity in those areas. So we've created a focus vertical around that where we, you will see us making acquisitions, making partnerships and creating a value proposition to move from just being a supplier of components to subsystems and partnership mode with a lot of companies in those sectors. Because it's like uh, it's like ground zero. You know, you're going from zero in you know hydrogen across the world to where it will be in 50 years probably a mainstream of energy. So it's like, you know, the steam engine or, uh, you know, any kind of energy revolution that took place. Is, we're at the early stages of that. So that's the other sector. Defense, as you know, is some, somewhere where we've been working for a long time, yeah. almost 10 years. We have two primary products that we're focusing on. One is artillery and the second is protected vehicles. In artillery, our ATAX gun has passed all its user trials, it has done so very successfully with flying colors and hopefully now that the trials are over we're going to be in a stage where we can go to uh, receiving orders rfqs that whole process okay. uh, aerospace is a market where we focus a lot on technological products uh, metallurgical products and I'm very happy to say that we will see our aerospace business almost double this year and next year from the previous years 
So why or why? Because we are seeing a lot of new traction and a lot of new orders. Uh, so these are, let's say, the you know multiple verticals. EV we have invested a lot on the light weighting and EV side. So there we have a play on the light weighting in terms of components and subsystems, and in power electronics, control electronics, and components and subsystems for electric vehicles, right from two-wheeler, three-wheeler components to uh, light and medium commercial vehicles. So that will give us a big play over the next seven, eight years as those sectors mature. Um, conventional we, vehicles. That's conventional. The so conventional that vehicles. I said. The one right now conventional that, vehicles. Uh, we will be the company. last man standing. Okay. Okay. We want to be the lowest cost, highest quality producer, and technology partner for anybody who's making uh, IC engines and IC engine based products going forward. So we will be able to do all the engineering, product development for the components and subsystems that they want. Because but this will become a smaller and smaller. Part no, of no, it will in fact grow, will grow because a lot of in-house manufacturing will move to outsourcing. So we expect that all in-house manufacturing for of, conventional yes. vehicles see, most, will move to outsourcing. See, most OEMs still have a lot of conventional manufacturing of Correct. components yes. and subsystems in-house. Yes. Now, when they have to invest for EV, you can't. Keep sustaining something that needs so that investment will shift to maybe exactly to like outsource yours. to outsourcing. Yeah, yes. that's what we hope. So that's the strategy there. But isn't the isn't the the, the, sh the shelf life of that business? It's ten to now fifteen in years. Countdown mode. It's in ten to fifteen years. But please remember years. that even when we move to full electric, they may be five to ten percent of the vehicles or fifteen percent, especially strategic issues could be to do with you know emergency vehicles or whatever, which is still a large population worldwide which will need support and will need replenishment. Okay. So there will be some amount that will remain. So what? while we are focusing on growth, we are also very conscious of sustainability. So every business of ours is incorporating complete ESG and uh, global ESG and sustainability norms in its business uh, uh, strategy. So every business will be using uh, more and more uh, renewable energy. Today, we on an aggregate use about 26 to 27 percent of renewable energy. Mm. By 2026, 20, we will cross 50 percent, and by 2030, we will be substantially above 75 percent, plus becoming net water, uh, you know, uh, reduce your net water consumption, net zero wastage, and, uh, you know, put in place measures to be more uh, uh, climate conscious in every way are a large part of our mission going forward. So you painted a vivid picture. I have some quick questions Absolutely. to ask you uh, in response. Uh, the entry into some of these businesses, for instance, EV or renewable energy, let's say, for instance, hydrogen, uh, the client profile is very different. There. Very different. Uh, the project sizes are very different there. Uh, so what can we expect as you build out these businesses over the course of the next two or three years? How does this play out in your financials, in your margins, in your working capital requirements? You know, I know yeah. it's difficult to get specific at this stage, but you're broad planning for I'll tell you what we're doing. What we've done is we've created a prototyping and incubation center where even the customer is in a prototyping stage. So if the customer is making eight different iterations, hmm. we're working with them on all eight. We're making protos for them at a component level so that we also learn a little bit about the technology. We understand what works, what doesn't work. We're able to bring our metallurgical knowledge and our manufacturing capability to bear, to serve the customer and to bring a better product for the customer. So we're starting without making any large investments. Okay. It's only using our uh, existing manufacturing capabilities, but a lot of knowledge. Okay. So that's how we're starting because we know that this is going to be like a hockey stick. It's going to be two, three years of a lot of development and then version one, version two, version three. And by the time a stable, let's say, uh, cost comparative product comes out, we're still about three, four years away. And that too, it will have to be initially with some amount of support from the government or the environment or whatever, you know, in terms of uh, subsidies or so some kind. investment lean. All of this, this plan we, that you yes, printed out? Yes, is investment is, is lean investment till lean. we get to scale. And, and that would be where roughly 20, I don't know because 25 or I see I don't know because I'm not the I'm not making the end product. Got it. I'm going to be part of the supply chain for the end product. But you can see the development curve Absolutely. for some end products like EVs. So EVs we can see so even for, for EVs and is your client base mostly international or it's, is it it's global. It's completely global. It's completely global. Yeah, and I see our EV business as I've mentioned earlier also 
get into three digit million very soon okay. per year and then substantially grow from there hydrogen so on hydrogen we are already working with uh, three companies which make fuel cells so we are making 3d printed fuel cell uh, membranes for them mm. so this is a good way to start where you don't need hard tooling you can do things uh, very easily and effectively and each version in each product can be different because you're doing it in a 3d printing kind of uh, manner so we are again working using our knowledge and the customer's requirement in a very iterative manner so investment lean again, again that's investment lean so knowledge this heavy and from here to 2026 does not require large capital investments as yet in new facilities so we uh, so we have already so we have already made large investments in aluminum Correct. on the aluminum forging side both in germany and in the us yeah. so that capacity can take us to a revenue of about 350 million and our current revenue is about 80 million so that's almost a four four and a half x and then from there on we will continue growing so maybe one and a half years before that capacity gets full we will have to start expanding again okay okay um where or which of these segments do you think will drive both revenue and profitability uh, as you sort of implement this plan over the next five seven years so the relative growth will be highest in three sectors will be in aluminum initially so aluminum uh, components aluminum components which is traditional uh, no which is which is no all these are now largely ev and hybrid okay okay so we have got large orders which we have orders more than enough to meet that 350 million and beyond okay so that is one industrial is going to be the second right. which will be a very big growth driver we see huge demand we will be able to almost double our industrial business in the next three years mostly global demand or local demand both both both, both. global it's 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 local and global got it okay. and the third will be uh so aluminum industrials you were talking about and which will be the key drivers yes of third will be ev right and obviously the fourth but will EV be you said is aluminum right no so no also ev aluminum. no also ev in electronics okay so power electronics control electronics you know ev so components you're getting into the full gamut absolutely in the entire gamut of ev uh, and we will supply both components and uh, entire drivetrains for two wheelers, three wheelers, light commercial vehicles, and up to from a three ton to a 11 ton vehicle. Okay. Uh, and then the defense we know is going to kick in. It's just a matter of when the ordering process is complete. For the artillery. For the artillery. And the vehicles are already a continuing business. Yes. They're at about 100 million a year and will continue growing. Okay. So I get. Aluminium, EV, big area of growth, yes. industrial, second yes, big area absolutely, of growth. Yes, absolutely. Defense will be third. Also. And then you've got some of the conventional businesses. And aerospace. And aerospace. But aerospace is starting from a much smaller base. Sure. So but the rate of growth is high. I get that. Yeah. How does this change the profile of your financials? How does this change how investors should be viewing so Forge over the course of the That's a very years? good question uh, because, you know, we're not a, just a forging company anymore. We've become right. an industrials company. And the reason for dividing the company into five verticals is that we're able to explain each vertical better because it's based on end markets. So that there may be different analysts who track these different verticals. So that's one. The second is it will allow each vertical to grow its own business with its own risk and reward and based on the kind of returns they generate. And we don't look at the whole as a sum. Obviously, when we need to incubate a business, we will invest in that to incubate it. But I also want each business to perform based on you know, each management to be responsible for their performance. Right. So you have you to make. Tell me how the financial profile will change. So the financial profile, I think, a the size is going to grow. Well, okay. Course, yes. B is. But by how much? Have you put in milestones? I have put in milestones, but I'm not going to talk about that today. Give me a well, sense of. Very how, very large. What I mean, is the magnitude of change? By 2030, it's going to be a completely different company. Okay. Yeah. And uh, the financial profile will change because A, I think we will be a much more mainstream company. Today, where make things which are not so easily understandable to That's people. True. I think we will, be, we will be much more relevant to many more people. So okay. that's one. Financially, I think the company has a very strong financial footing. I think my goal is to continue that and to make sure that each vertical remains strong. And each vertical then can act as a company on its own. And so I, I know I'm sort of getting ahead of myself here. 
but at some point you mean post 2026 you might even look at separating these out and Abs them absolutely i mean value. you have to unlock value okay so the reason for doing this is the first step towards it got it yeah. all right so but we are far idea. away from that yes well i think this seems but to at be least you need to think about it out what yeah. your blueprint is yes. for the next four years yes and then we'll i guess get a chance to measure how absolutely. close you're coming to any of these plans absolutely Ab absolutely right? what could go wrong in all of this no, I don't there are so blue many sky. things. No, no, I don't mean blue sky, but serious implementation challenges. No, there are implement. Like, are you concerned about the current rising interest rate cycle and what that means for financing? Though you told me it's a capital. It doesn't. Plan. It is not going to impact our financing. I'm worried about some of our customers. I'm right. worried about the end buyer. Right. How does it affect his? How, what I was just how does it affect his? Uh, this inflationary environment. What is it doing to end consumer? Because his demand? his uh, distribute his disposable income goes down. Right. And what happens to their buying choices? So these are all factors. But I think with you know India being on a pretty strong wicket, we expect that you know the growth rates that we are factoring in into our growth for India markets, I think, are not. And you haven't seen, let's say, through the course of the last we spoke to you was after your March results, Correct. right? In the course of this quarter, April and May, have you seen any slackening in industrial demand either because the businesses themselves are feeling the pain or their end consumers are not buying any slackening in industrial demand no. or project under implementation no. or the order book uh, you know momentum no so uh, so we don't supply to any business which is in project mode we're not a project, project yeah mode, but like you know what i mean yeah so i just mean like expansion plans adding new facilities actually plans, right now I mean. right now india is getting ready to restart the capital cycle if you look at the steel companies, if you look that. at and the cement companies, we absolutely, absolutely. Before the Ukraine war absolutely. broke out, uh, and now I'm not sure whether that no, still I think, stands, especially with the interest rate scenario. I think it will stand. So you're not seeing any slack. Nothing in right now. I even spoke to you know the head of Axis Bank a little while ago, so and he I, also so he also I, said the same thing. He doesn't. Yeah, well, he struck a note of confidence. Yeah, as so well. he also said the same yes, thing. Yes, but you've got a year to the ground in terms of. No, I don't see clients, much of a difference, uh, and therefore you have a better idea of what the mood. The one in thing, is. the one thing that I do see, uh, unfortunately, is that a lot of second and third tier players in industries are falling by the wayside, yes. and the stronger becoming stronger. Whether you look at capital goods, whether you look at EPC, how many EPC companies do we have in India now? Yeah. Yeah. So. I think there is an opportunity for more. So somebody will come in, some global companies will come in, or somebody will start their own, you know, arms because we don't have enough for building the future of India. Yes. Corporate concentration yeah. is actually it's a, it's a, a risk. Concern. It's, a, it's absolutely and a risk, risk as yeah. you pointed out. Yeah. All right, you painted a vivid picture not just of the Bharat Forge of the future, but the fact that at least in the short to medium term, you see no decline in demand in India as yet. Not yet. All right. Thank you so much, Thank Arif, you. for speaking to us here in Pleasure. Davos. Take Have care. a good trip. Always good seeing you. Thank, Thank you. you.